نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله امراض القلوب واللسان اللقاء الحادي عشر المرض غض البصر وهذا هو اللقاء الرابع والاخير من هذا المرض الانسان ايها الاحبه في الله خلق من التراب ويعيش على التراب ويتعامل مع التراب ويموت تحت التراب يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى قل للمؤمنين يغضوا من ابصارهم ويحفظوا فروجهم ذلك ازكى لهم ويقول الشاعر ان الرجال الناظرين الى النساء مثل الكلاب تطوف باللحمان ان لم تصن تلك اللحوم اسودها اكلت بلا عوض ولا اثمان evil actions of the heart this is our 11th meeting and we are talking about the disease of not lowering your gaze not lowering your gaze and this is the fourth lecture under that title and inshallah it will be our last lecture referring to that disease we all know brothers and sisters that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us from dust and we know that we are living on dust and we know that we are dealing with dust and we know that we will be buried under dust If we know this fact, we know who we are and how we should act. Arrogance is out of the question for someone who knows who he is and where he came from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us by commanding Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to command us to lower our gates. And this command is addressed and directed to the believers. men and women to lower our gaze and to chase our privates this is more purifying and more good for all of us so he commanded us first to lower the gaze before chasing our privates which to tell us that anything that leads to the evil action referred to or known as fornication or adultery any mean that leads to it is haram and the first and the most important mean that we are dealing with is not lowering your gaze i'm addressing sisters my sisters who are listening this is a command for men and women and sisters have a great responsibility and a big role in eliminating this disease and controlling it because if they are keen on fulfilling the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it would be made easier for men to fulfill that command too so we are addressing men and we are commanding men day after day to lower their gaze and to do uh, stay away from anything that could lead or may lead to fornication so we are dealing with the core of the problem and the core of the problem is really in essence sisters because if the sister dresses according to the sharia and behaves according to the sharia and goes out and in according to the sharia and does not wear the things that contradicts the command of the sharia and they don't leave their homes with makeup they don't leave their homes with perfume they don't leave their homes with attractive clothes they don't leave their home with transparent clothes or tight clothes or they don't mix and deal and talk and change their walk and all of those a deviant behavior that attracts the attention of men then the problem will be dealt a lot easier with it's not going to eliminate the problem 100% percent, 
but definitely it's going to make it the least. We have talked about Al-Ilaj. We said, how do we cure that problem? I'm just going to remind you of what we said last time and then we get in our topic. Number one is shy. You need to shy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shyness is understood by guarding your head and everything that is attached to it, from hearing, from uh, seeing, from uh, talking, your stomach and everything attached to it, your privates, your hands, your legs and such, and the food that you eat, and so forth. So, eliminate that, or safeguard that, or be shy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to disobey Him with any of that. Have a sincere and a determined intention to change in yourself. Number three, do not expose yourself to the places where you know you're going to be uh, tried or tested with this disease that makes it hard for you to control. Number four, know the consequences of too much looking, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you and the sin that you are committing and the punishment that you may uh, be inflicting upon yourself. Number five, dua. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you cope with that problem if you have that problem. And number six, get married. And this is the best solution. It's not going to eliminate it either. Because unless you are a believer, unless you don't have the uh, temptations everywhere, this thing is not going to be eliminated completely, but it definitely reduces it to the minimum. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us as reported by Imam Muslim rahimahullah, Al-Mar'a tukbilu fi surat shaytan, wa tukbilu fi surat shaytan, fa'idha absara, aw fa'idha basura ahadukum imra'a, falyakti ahlahu, fa'inna fi thalika yaruddu ma fi qalbih. وفي رواية إن معها مثل الذي معها. This hadith can be also misunderstood in reference to women. Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم text translation directly it would say that the woman comes in a picture of shaitan and leaves in a picture of shaitan. Many people, ignorant people, who don't know the meaning of the wording, the context of the wording, they have a deviant intention to attack Islam from the Muslims themselves and to look down at women, misunderstand that, and they say, we are comparing women with devils. Absolutely has nothing to do with it. We know shaitan's main objective is to deviate us, to take us to hell in every possible way, the quickest and the easiest way. Shaitan understand that women are created so loved to men. Shaitan understands that he can use women to deviate women and men. Men created, they are infatuated with women. And women created that they are infatuated with luxury and infatuated for, with compliments and like, liking to show off. Shaitan, as soon as the woman leaves, he is inciting her and everyone who looks at her as if she is the shaitan. I'll give you an example. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu told us that uh, or, or uh, commanded us not to pray when the sun is setting or when the sun is rising at that instant. He said because in the الشمس تطلع بين قرني شيطان وتغيب بين قرني شيطان that the sun rises from in between two horns of a shaitan and sets in between two horns of a shaitan now what do you understand from that? that here is a shaitan and he's carrying the sun between his two horns? no at this time when the sun sets People used to worship the sun. We all know that from the story of Ibrahim and many others. So people when the sun sets and when the sun rises, those who worship the sun, they bow for it at that time. When she sets and when she rises. 
Shaitan with his arrogance and his love for being worshipped, he goes and he pose himself in front of the sun as if the sun is rising from between his, uh, as if he has the sun in between his two horns. Really, the sun is the sun. But he goes and he stands there. Okay? Woman leaves the house. He stands there as if he is her. But definitely she is herself and he has nothing to do with her except using her to deviate and attract men. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu told us, this is what the shaitan does. As soon as the woman exits her or leaves her home, shaitan is waiting at the door to make everything bad for her so she can look good and attract people. And when she comes back, he does the same thing until she goes inside the house. So what does that mean? When Prophet Muhammad sallallahu says, Women and nisa'u habailu shaytan Women are the ropes of the shaytan. That means, he uses them as a rope to catch men by them. How? By telling them how to look and how to dress and giving them hope and making them feel good about themselves, enticing and attracting everything for them so they can deviate men. So this is how we should understand that. It is not women, it is the shaitan who does that because he knows. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, this is what the shaitan does. If any of you sees a woman and he's attracted to her, now I'm talking about a quick look without intention. Okay, you're supposed to turn your head. If you saw something you like, and it's bothering you, rather than taking another look, what do you do? Go home, and your wife has what this woman has. She'll be able to satisfy you. This is the command of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rather than thinking about it, rather than taking another look, rather than chasing her, rather than living in that uh, pain and grief and all of those thoughts that you may have in your heart and get the sense, go home and your wife is there, she has what she has. That's why we said marriage will solve most of that problem. Also we said the benefits of lowering your gaze is to fulfill the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is sufficient to know that you are an obedient person. يُورِثُ الْقَلْبَ نُورًا وَسُرُورًا وَالْوَجْهِ إِنْشِرَاحًا The second one is, it gives your heart, it illuminates your heart, it makes your heart happy, and it brightens your face when you are lowering your gaze and not fulfilling the deviance and having that sin uh, inflicted with the results. Number three, it relieves your heart from the pain and the grief and the suffering of going after your lust. A person sees something he likes. He wants to see it again. He wants to take the opportunity. He wants to know how he can do it, how he can say it, how he can fulfill his need. He's constantly thinking and suffering and going home. That picture is in his mind and he is living in an agony and he is not getting anything that he wants and not to mention that the evil sin of all of that. It makes your heart rid of the drunkness of the lust and the heedlessness. Because lust and love for women like that, when you look and when you see, it's like a person becomes drunk. The person who is in love with those things, he is drunk. He is not knowing what he's doing. He's behaving in a way that a drunk person behaves. Not controlled by his mind, but his lust is in control. Also, it makes your heart busy with things that doesn't benefit you. Rather, with something that benefits you. Because when you talk about the look, the eyes and the heart have connection. They share the same entrance. What comes to the eyes comes to the heart. If you cut that entrance, you close it, you have saved the heart and vice versa. So when you look, this is how you will be, uh, subhanAllah, this is how you will protect yourself. 
يقول وإذا فسد النظر فسد القلب وإذا فسد القلب صار كالمزبلة التي في محل النجاسات والقاذورات فلا يصلح لسكن معرفة الله ومحبته ونزبه When your heart is becoming evil it becomes like a dump it becomes like a trash or a pile of trash it is not fitting for loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is not fitting for anything good to reside in it it is a trash place so once you protect yourself from that then your heart will be capable of accepting the Quran accepting the command accepting the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's why some people you remind them of the ayah you remind them of the hadith they don't respond because their heart is not the right place for accepting that. It is inhabited with evil. So first you have to clean it, then you have to bring all the good uh, things to it before you can do anything. Number six, it makes it easy for you to seek knowledge. And to, it facilitates for you the ways and the roads to knowledge. And number seven, it will give you deep insight. It makes the person when he makes a decision, it makes him, it helps him because your heart is clean and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you better understanding because of your obedience. It makes the person make good decisions. It makes the person uh, understand <laughs> the uh, commands in a lot better way than a person who is disobedient. You know in the hadith that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa commanded us, if we hear something, to memorize it, and to teach it to others. And he said, Maybe a person who's telling that hadith is less knowledgeable than the person who's listening, or maybe a person who has this understanding of this hadith is going to deliver it to someone who's better and more understanding of that hadith, meaning he will benefit from it too. And how did you get that better understanding? It is simply by the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lowering your gaze also closes the door of the shaitan from which he enters to your heart. And we say here, look what he said. He said, Sahib al qalb al marir yastalidhu bihad al sum, ay sum al nadar, alladhi fihi halaku, tamaman kama yastalidhu al ajra bihak al jild. You're talking about. Uh, a person who is looking and this look is a poison arrow the person who is getting that poison arrow in, her, in his heart killing himself with it he's feeling good about it and it's really in it his death like a person who has what do you call that disease that makes you itch Yeah, I'm sorry, it's Yeah, that disease. When a person itches, what does that do? It opens the pores in the skin. And the virus or the insect or whatever that causes that disease, it has a better access to the body. So it makes it worse and through that it, you will end up killing yourself. Even though you feel good when you're scratching, but in reality you're killing yourself. It feels good when you're looking, but in reality, you're going to end up killing yourself. Last time, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> I said something probably some people either misunderstood or uh, took it in a wrong understanding, and I will explain. Referring to the last question that one of the sisters asked uh, about uh, meeting with the uh, interviews and such and I said not to look or not to work to that extent but we'll explain. We have to understand one thing. It is a must on women to seek knowledge. Not just men, men and women. And the knowledge that we are talking about is the knowledge of the religion but you are not to limit it by religion. Meaning, before she needs to seek 
any other knowledge, she needs to understand her religion first. Then after that, go. You don't want to have a woman who is an engineer and she doesn't know how to pray. She doesn't know the basics of her religion. So we understand all that. The problem that we have that we only seek the worldly knowledge and we excel in it. We're not satisfied with a bachelor degree, we go for a master degree, we go for a doctor degree and, and we keep going until we get the max of that. And the sad part is the basics of our religion, we're not willing to read it, learn it, ask about it, or even worry if we are making it right or not. We just go on, this is how I learn it. Some people may ask, so, you're saying that we can, assuming that there is a sister who understood her religion and she studied something. So, she going to spend four or five years and waste her life. And then you're telling me that she cannot go out and work and she cannot mix and she cannot shake hands and she cannot have an interview with a male and such, then what's the point? What are you talking about? Well, we tell you something. Yeah. Number one, al ilmu nur bikul anwar. Knowledge and knowledgeable people. When you get the knowledge, it is light. It is beauty in all kinds of knowledge. Whatever knowledge you have, it is a beauty, and it is very rewarding if you have the right intention when you seek it. Even if you don't act upon it, even I mean, I, you don't uh, use it. It is rewarding. This is like you go to study how to do anything, just to be a teacher. And you did not teach. Your intention is to benefit. But for some reason you did not. You are rewarded because man salaka tariqan yaltamisu bihi ilman salaka Allahu bihi tariqan ila al-jannah. If you go in a path, you're seeking knowledge. Whether it is religion, religious knowledge or not, with the intention for the sake of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking you on a road to Jannah. He did not say, and if he goes and he uses that and he works with it. That's number one. Most of our looks materialistic. Here we are. I graduated, I better make some money. If I don't make some money, then all my life is a waste. What does that tell me? It tells me that you don't have the intention from the beginning. Your intention was not pure for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is like I'm teaching him about Islam. And he did not listen to me. Then I get mad at him. I drop him. I say I'm not going to talk to him. He doesn't listen. Is this right? No. I got the reward for talking to him. Whether he accepts it or not. The same thing. I got the reward for seeking the knowledge. Whether I use it or not. If I have the intention to start with. Now let's, let's look at this. You studied something, four systems. Can't you work in Islamic schools? Can't you work in a masjid? Can't you work at home? From home where you can conduct many people, all their businesses from home. Men, not women, conducting their businesses at home. You can do that. Can't you work in a place where you fulfill the hijab and you are protecting yourself from any haram? If you fulfill those, then you are welcome to do that. But if you're going to involve yourself in haram, then that is not an excuse to say, well, I studied or why did I study for? Do not forget, brothers and sisters, that even here in this country, that is not a Muslim country, even the non-Muslims resorted to teaching their children at home because of the evil and the corruption in public schools. You know if you take your son or your daughter to an Islamic school, it's expensive. And we know why, and it's not even enough for the Islamic schools. Well, if you have studied, don't you think that the woman can take care of her children at home and homeschool them? If the non-Muslims are doing that, can she benefit from that? Look at the reward she get and look at the money that she saved because she has soft knowledge. Second thing, al-ilm silah. Knowledge is like a weapon. 
It is a weapon. And the weapon is, you use it only when you need it. You have a gun, you're not constantly shooting. You have that gun, you protect yourself when you need it. The woman who has the knowledge is the same thing. She is to use that knowledge whenever needed. Example. The job of her husband is not sufficient for their basic needs. She uses that knowledge to help him. The second one is her husband lost his job. She works to support the family. When she's divorced, her parents are in need for spending. Her husband cannot spend or doesn't want to spend. But he allows her to work and spend on her parents, she can use that. So as you can see, the knowledge will not go in vain like we think. It is rewarding, it is used when it's needed, and it can be used in the right places at the same time. So this is uh, something to keep in mind, that brothers and sisters, halal and haram does not change wherever you go. It is not that I'm living in America, I'm living in Europe, I'm living somewhere, then uh, because of the pressure I'm going to make the halal haram and the haram halal. This is not accepted in Islam. Allah is the same here and there. When He legislated something, we all know what it means. Now when you talk about necessities and all that, this is an exception of the rule, an exception of the rule and everyone knows that. So, looking is haram. Not lowering your gaze is haram. Handshaking is haram. Working and mixing and all of that is haram. We need to understand that. Because looking is the door to fornication and adultery. If you were to make looking, because this is tahrim al wasal anything that leads to haram is haram. This is known fact and known rule in Islam. So if I want to make looking permissible, then I'm going to have to make fornication permissible. Because this leads to that. So if looking is permissible with the other one. There are exceptions to looking. As we mentioned, you know, the doctor can look. That is a need. And the one who wants to get married can look. That is a need. We're not talking about that. We're talking about general uh, looking for those people who let their uh, eyes roam here and there. So once we understand that, inshallah, uh, this will clear my uh, stand of what I said last time. <laughs> also, one brother asked me a question, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me to find uh, the answer. One brother asked me when I said, getting married fulfills or uh, completes half of your religion. This is an authentic hadith. As I told you, I wasn't able to uh, authenticate that, but alhamdulillah, I found it. It is in Sahih al jamil and in Al-Hadith Al-Sahihah for uh, Shaykh Al-Bani Rahimahullah, it is an authentic hadith. The hadith states, إِذَا تَزَوَّجَ الْعَبْدُ فَقَدْ إِسْتَكْمَلَ نِسْفَ الدِّينِ فَلْيَتَّقِ اللَّهِ بِالنِّسْفِ الْآخِرِ When the servant gets married, he has completed half of his deen, then he should have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the second half. Also, Tawus, one of the great scholars of Tafsir, he said, Al-Mar'a shatru deen al-rajul. The woman is half of the religion of the man. And I think sisters can relate to that and understand that when we focus on how much the shaitan uses them to deviate men. If Prophet Muhammad wasallam says that the woman completes half of the religion of a man, what an honor is that for a woman? You cannot get bigger honor than that. At the same time, how dangerous a woman can be to a man. So you, you, you take it, it's like a sword that has two sharp edges. It is an honor for her if she chased herself, if she takes care of herself, and at the same time, it is destructive force for men if she doesn't. And uh, this is uh, a status for a woman to understand that because of the intense love that men have for women. I promise you to conclude uh, or to talk about the, uh, at the youth. Now, uh, we have to talk about that. At the youth, Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغَارُ وَإِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ يَغَارُ وَإِنَّ غِيرَةَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يَلْقَ الْمُؤْمِنَ مَا حَرَّمَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يَأْتِ الْمُؤْمِنَ مَا حَرَّمَ اللَّهِ 
عليه. الله سبحانه وتعالى gets angry when someone looks. And the believer gets angry when someone looks at his mahram. The anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the ghira, see ghira, it would not be fitting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say that Allah is jealous. But we are talking about jealousy. The ghira of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to see someone doing something he prohibited. And we are talking about ghira. One of the companions radiallahu anhum, his wife committed an adultery and he caught her. He went to the Prophet ﷺ to complain to him. He told him, you're going to get 80 lashes or you better have four witnesses. He said, oh Prophet of Allah, I saw her. He said, 80 lashes or four witnesses because this is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for someone to accuse another person with fornication or with adultery. He said, by Allah, Allah is going to reveal something to show that I am I'm truthful and honest. Sure enough, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses and finding a way out for this sahabi, which is what we call liha, is the husband curses the wife four times uh, that she has committed it, either she accepts it or she would curse back four times that she is uh, honest and free from that. The point I'm trying to make, one of the companions was present when this companion said so and so, and the Prophet Sallallahu told him, you better have four witnesses. So I believe it's Sa'd ibn Ubadah. Sa'd ibn Mu'ad. Sa'd ibn Mu'ad, khayr. Sa'd said, Ya Rasulullah, O Prophet of Allah, you catch your wife doing this and you go look for her. Witnesses, by Allah, if that happens to me, I will hit that person with the sharp edge of the sword. Basically, I'll kill him. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ did not say anything, which means approval to what he said. He said, do you see how sad, how jealous sad is for his honor? By Allah, I am more jealous than him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I hate to say the word, has more hero than me and Sa'd. Which is, see how angry Sa'd was, Prophet Muhammad Wasallam gets more angry, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets very angry when someone disobeys him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk about that, we are looking at believers. Believers who don't get angry or fear jealousy, when someone looks at their wife, or their sister, or their relatives. Now when we say look, we're not meaning just any passing look. We are referring to not only others looking, but them themselves, how they leave the house. You go out with your wife. The clothes that she is wearing is very attractive to men. You're a man, you can tell. And it's okay with you to walk with her. This is a form of dieta. This is a form of dieta. You see your daughters not wearing the hijab. And you see them going out. This is another form of dieta. You don't feel jealous. It doesn't move you. It doesn't bother you to see someone looking or to see your wife wearing something that you know it attracts men. Rather, you could be more sick. You like others to look at her. Like some people do. Look, but don't touch. What does that mean? They're enjoying it. Now, I'm not talking about Muslim, but yani the point is, they may have the same understanding, but they will not express it in the form of words. Who is the, the youth? Look what Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said. Thalatha qad harram Allahu alayhim al jannah mudmin al khamr wal aaq wal dayyuth alladhi yukr al khabatha fi ahli. Three people. Jannah is forbidden for them. A person who is. Uh, a person who is an alcoholic. That's number one. 
The second one, the person who deals with his parents in ill manner. He is aq, he is not obedient. And the third one, at the youth, the one who sees the evil happening in his family, referring to the women's side, and he doesn't care. Basically approves it and let it go. And this evil could be, as I mentioned, the way they look and the way they behave and the way they go out, or when men do uh, any kind of looks or any kind of talks with them. I'll give you an example at the end. So this is not limited to the wife. It is the wife, it is the sister, it is the mother, it is the aunts. Those relations that we call maharim, it doesn't bother you to see that. And unfortunately, brothers, here our children are almost immune to jealousy. They don't have that. They don't, even, they don't even think of that. I personally ask children, one person, I asked him, another brother was jealous because this brother said something to him about his sister. And he told me, please talk to him. He keeps tell, talking to me like that and he talks to my sister or something. I went to him and I was using my old fashioned style. Would you like someone to do this and this to your sister? And he said, why not? I said, I'm on the wrong ship. <laughs> I said, okay, let's rephrase that. Would you like to get beaten by him? <laughs> no, I don't like that. So the point is, if you talk to them, they don't have that jealousy. Why? Because of the way that they are brought up. When you have a person living and working and uh, going to school with girls, no difference, sister, brother, everyone is talking, family is going out. Nowadays, alhamdulillah, which is alhamdulillah for good and bad, where you have places where uh, all they do is like what they call it coffee shops, Muslim coffee shops, where you go, you smoke and you uh, use that uh, hoka or whatever that thing is, and music and you name it, brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah. It's at least Muslim bar, right? It's a, this is how they look at it. Alhamdulillah, he is not in a disbeliever bar. All of that is making our children, boys and girls, lose shyness, period, and lose jealousy, period. Why? Because we have not done the same thing from the beginning to protect it. So, this is, the jealousy is something preferred, something loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The opposite of jealousy is the youth. Diyatha is a major sin. It is a major sin because anytime Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatens you with the hellfire or not to go to Jannah with any sin, know that this is a major sin. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made defending your honor a form of shahada. If someone attacks your wife or attacks your daughters or attacks any of those maharim and you fight that person to death, you go to Jannah. This is how Islam looks at those things. And that's why we sometimes not understanding how important it is, we belittle those glasses and we belittle the way they dress and we just say, oh, it's no big deal, it's not harming anyone, it's just something passing by. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, الزاني لا ينكح إلا زانية أو مشركة والزانية لا ينكحها إلا زان أو مشرك وحرم ذلك على المؤمنين. Also another form of women who is cursed and will not enter the Jannah, رجلة النساء. رجلة النساء, a woman who is behaving like a man, dressed like a man, speaking like a man, acting like a man. Whether it is words, whether it is acting tough, or you know, going, doing some weightlifting and some stuff like that, a woman who behaves like a man will not, as Prophet Muhammad said, will not enter the jannah. A woman is supposed to behave like a woman, and a man is supposed to behave like a man. Let me give you some example. I conclude with that, inshallah, uh, our talk about lowering your gaze. Examples for those people who 
fit the description of being the youth. الأب الذي يعرف يعرف أن ابنته تصادق أحد الشباب ويتغافل عن ذلك. A father who knows that his daughter is having a boyfriend, even if it is just a friendly relationship, and acts like he doesn't know. He's a day youth. الأب الذي يسمح لابنته أو زوجته أن تتعطر وتلبس البنطال والملابس الضيقة أو الشفاف. A father who let his daughter or his wife wear perfume, dress real tight clothes or transparent clothes, and let her out, go out, accepts that he is a dayuf. الأخ الذي يرى أخته تمشي مع أحد الشباب فيذهب ويصافحه ويتعرف عليه. A brother who sees his sister walking with another man, he goes and he meets him. I am her brother, good to see you and such. He is a dayuf. الزوج الذي يترك زوجته وحدها في المنزل مع أي عمل. The husband who leave her house at home, uh, leave his uh, wife at home, and someone is coming to do some repair in the house, and he doesn't care. She's alone, a man is coming to do some repair in the house, he doesn't care, he is a dayuf. I know some of you are going to say, what if there is nobody? Still, he's a day youth. He has to find something because there is a way out of this where his wife can bring her friend, can bring her neighbor, can, you can do something. It's not impossible to do that because this is worse than just looks. الزوج الذي يجعل زوجته تصافح ضيوفه في البيت وأصدقائه أو أصدقائه في العمل. The man who makes his wife or watches his wife shaking hands with his guests or with his friends at work. Now this is a sharp one, this is a tough one because Alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us from things that we don't know. But this is going to establish a new rule. The man who goes shopping with his wife and he leaves her with a man, a salesman, to negotiate the price and take the discount and this and that. And he is sitting on the side watching his beautiful wife save him a few dollars. Laughing with the guy, joking with the guy. You know how salesmen are. Yeah, they're going to do that. There's no doubt. And then when she saves him some money, he goes, Wallahi, you are a very good negotiator. You know, MashaAllah. This person is the youth. And then, الرجل الذي يجلس مع أهل بيته من النساء يشاهدون التلفزيون فيرون لقطة فاضحة أو منظر خليع أو أي شيء مثلا لا يصدر العود. He is a day youth. The person who is sitting in front of the TV and they're watching some despicable pictures for, let's say, men wrestling. What are they wearing? Sitting there, not only bad for him too, but his wife and his daughter, and they see things, and it's like, there's no problem with that. This person has a problem with that. He had that. الزوج الذي يستمع لزوجته وهي تتغزل في أحد الممثلين أو المغنيين. You know, you have some good-looking singers and good, good actors, especially some of those women who camp 24 hours on episodes and uh, uh, those shows that, especially there's a show that I heard, I don't know, some guy from Turkey or something, and women are going berserk over that man. And they talk in front of their husbands how beautiful he is and how he is. If the person doesn't do something about this, then he is a day youth. Because when you see your wife, I know in the back of your mind, no, she can't do anything. But this is not the point. The point is what kind of jealousy do you have? What kind of love do you have for Allah? What kind of love do you have for your honor? This is what we are talking about. 
تومور الأب الذي يرى أحد بناته تجلس على الإنترنت بالساعات ويعلم أنها تعمل شات مع الرجال. A man sees the daughter sitting on the sitting on the internet, and he knows that she's making chat with boys. Oh, there's nothing wrong with chatting. The essence of evil is from chatting. There is no chatting between a man and a woman, even if the man is married to four. No innocent chatting. I don't care what anyone might say. There is no innocent chatting. Even if the person she is chatting with is gay. No innocent chatting. This is a disaster. That when you know and you just ignore that and you don't see anything more wrong with that. And the final one. الأخ الذي يجعل أخته تتعرف على إحدى الفتيات لكونه معجبا بها ويريد أخته أن تعرفه عليها. One young man, he sees a beautiful woman, he wants to get to know her. His sister is there at work, at home, in the school, and he just goes to his sister, sister, I like this one, could you go tell to her and kind of hook me up with her? <laughs> Here's a day youth. And you can really understand that these are not far-fetched situation, it's reality. We're seeing it, we're living it, and unfortunately, we are losing it when it comes to uh, really having uh, our honor protected and our gaze and uh, our private chase. This is a disaster that we, inshallah, need to control and get rid of. With that, brothers and sisters, we conclude the disease of not lowering your gaze. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us lower our gaze and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our wives, our sisters, and our daughters, and our mothers, and ourselves. And then, istaghfiruka wa tubu alayk. Wa jazakumullahu khayran. We think of another disease, insha'Allah, between now and next Wednesday. Until then, I leave you with the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As-salamu alaykum.